fifty percent of marriages end in divorce, but it's worse than that. When you when you survey the other fifty percent and say how many of you are actually happy, ninety some percent of those say we're not happy. So it's, they, they've stayed together for the kids, they've stayed together for their finances, they've stayed together for their welfare, they've uh, or for their for their for their wealth, they've stayed together for uh, the sake of anything other than happiness. So you're looking at like probably ninety five percent of marriages are in, in in chaos right now, in trauma. Yeah. Unsatisfied, un unsatisfied, unhealthy, unhappy, unfulfilled. 90 plus percent of marriages are in that state, yet we still continue down the path of Western values that we're told this is how you be a husband, this is how you be a wife. I mean, like everything I knew about being a husband was wrong. Everything about what being a man was is wrong. Hello and welcome to the Disrupt the Everyday podcast. We're here to help you navigate life while disrupting the status quo. Our discussions cover a number of topics relevant to everyday life. We discuss everything from relationships to entrepreneurship. We also engage in some difficult but important conversations. And now, here are your hosts, Brian and Tanya Hamilton. Welcome to another episode of the Disrupt the Everyday podcast. Today we'll be talking about some of the mistakes that you want to avoid to ensure that you have a good marriage. And we'll be discussing this with Cody Butler. Cody, thanks for joining us today. Oh, thank you so much for, for having me on. It's my pleasure and privilege. Thank you. Well, Cody, I always like to start off by learning about our guest. So we're going to start off by asking, who is Cody Butler? Okay, great question to start with. So I am a God-centered man, a husband and a father in that order, and a businessman, last of all. And, and what I do is I, is I help other God-centered men to uh, release, the tra release the trauma from their marriage and, and create the marriage that God designed it to be for them. Awesome. Awesome stuff. Now, uh, I hear a little bit of an accent there. You mind telling <laughs> us uh, a little bit about where you're located? Oh, goodness. I'm located in Australia, but uh, I've been all over. So I started, I was born and raised in the United Kingdom in England. I went to, uh, I moved to the U.S., I went to college in the U.S. and I stayed there for uh, 10, 10 or 12 years after that. And then I went back to the U.K., met my wife, who's Australian, and now I'm in Australia. So a little bit of everything. Mongrel, mongrel accent. <laughs> I'm an international man of the world. International man of mystery. Well, it, it's interesting, too, how uh, how that tends to happen, even if it's even if you're not traveling across the world. But it, it seems to be the, the common story. You, you marry a woman and somehow you end up living where she's from or somewhere close to. <laughs> women women make men do things they ordinarily wouldn't do. <laughs> there you go. It's said by a man. <laughs> we do strange things when a woman's involved. Yeah. It, yeah. And we, you know what? We have a tendency to do that. But I think the biggest thing is that like, really, when you think of it, there always has to be that communication. Right. That's like right. that talk back and forth. And that's the difference. You know, we always say, right. It's that like having that back and forth communication. What would the pros be if we move back to Australia? What would the you know pros be if we stayed here and, you know, hearing out people? I think that's the biggest thing where, you know, in relationships and marriage, that's what we we're talking about today. Sometimes people don't feel heard. Right. And that's where, you know, even just with my background in work and what I used to do, that's where the problems usually came up when people didn't feel heard. What do you think about that? Uh, I think that's absolutely right. I mean, women like men, men overcomplicate the situation. They say women are complicated. It's like women are very not very complicated at all. They, they want to they want to be seen, heard and understood. And it's like if your wife is unhappy right now, it's because she's not feeling seen. She's not feeling heard and she's not feeling understood now. Obviously, that there's a whole series of, of, of actions that go into that that cause that problem. But ultimately, that that's what it is. Saving a marriage, turning a marriage around is, is, is really a, a remarkably simple thing. You just have to understand that if your wife's not happy, it's because she's not feeling seen, understood, and, and heard. That's it. That's all there is to it, really. It's like mm -hmm. that. there's nothing more to it than that. Right now, and, and you speak from personal experience. And I think I think even if we go into the story of, you getting married, like just getting to that point. I know there were some visa issues. <laughs> so could you share some of that with us? Oh man. Yeah, no, it was, uh, so, so as, as I just said, my wife's from Australia and, and I'm from, from, from England and visas are real things, right? You can't just move around the world and do what you want to do. It's like, this is very regulated stuff. And she was, she was in uh, the UK on a, on a student visa 
we were at the same college together. We were studying music at the same music college. And uh, there came a point when her visa expired and she had to go back to Australia. And we decided that we wanted to get married, that that was what we wanted to do. And really, like, we had to do that because I wasn't allowed to go into Australia and stay. And she wasn't allowed to come to the UK and stay. So the only option really for us to stay together was to get married. So while she was in Australia, we applied for a marriage visa and we got declined. The, and people, you know, it's funny, people go, oh, the government can't tell you who you can marry. <laughs> really? Really? It's like <laughs> they, the government can tell you anything they want. They, 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 they can do anything they want. So uh, we were both musicians at the time. And it's like the, you know, the starving musician is not something that, 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 that didn't come about from nothing. <laughs> <laughs> musicians are hungry because they don't get paid. And, and I was making less than $10,000 a year as a musician. And the government just said, no, you're not. We're not giving her a visa because we're going to end up having to support both of you. And we're not prepared to put taxpayers dollars into supporting her. Mm -hmm. So that, that was that application was three thousand three thousand pounds, which is about probably five thousand dollars. So you know, wow. when, when, when your annual income is ten grand and half of it's just gone on an application and it's been denied, mm -hmm. and then paid another uh, I was another fifteen hundred I think to appeal that decision. The, the appeal got denied, and unfortunately, the judge he goes, I can see that this is real. I can see that he he goes, I would approve this, but the law does not allow me to approve this. So he was very nice. He goes, in my decision, I'm going to write, I would approve this if I was able to, but the law does not permit me. He goes, that way the next judge will see that this has been approved by a judge and that will help you a lot. So the judge was really nice. He was just bound by the law. But he's like, your only option is to reapply. And I'm like, another 3,000 pounds. Oh, man. <laughs> it's like, man. So this is going on for well over a year, right? Causing, causing major issues. Like, And, and I'm... The way I'm dealing with this is through more and more alcohol use. And we're so different. Me and my wife were so different. She's from an upper middle class, educated background, bankers, university presidents, uh, that kind of that kind of upper middle class. I'm, I'm from working class. Like, you know, we, we, we threw a party, man, if someone graduated from high school. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we celebrate. We, we celebrated. If somebody graduated from high school, that was like, you know, we'd, we'd have a, a good time. Very, very different, of course. In in the, the time that she was back in Australia, she was getting in her ear that this is this is like, it, do you really want to do this? Do you really want to do this? Do you really want to do this? It was socioeconomically, um, politically, everything was different, right? Everything was different between us. And then when we finally did get back together, when we finally did get approved after a almost a year and a half of going through the whole visa process and we finally did get back together. Uh, she, she's bringing sort of this attitude of disapproval towards me, not intentionally, but this is just mm. what she's been getting for all of these years. And she's starting to question things. She's like, well, we, whereas before she had unconditionally accepted me, she'd be like, are you going to wear those shoes to go see my friends? Are you really going to wear that jacket? Don't you think you should probably get a haircut? And it's like, you know, just, just these little things of, it's gone from unconditional acceptance to you, you need to conform to where I'm at now sort of thing. And of course, the drinking had been going on as well. So when you put these two things together, that the, the, the shift in the relationship and the drinking, which was now a problem at this point, it was a big problem at this point, we ended up getting married and we, we were on rocky ground from day one. We were literally on rocky ground from day one. It was like that the relationship was going downhill from that point and my continued drinking did not help the situation at all till we arrived at a point where uh, only only god could have saved that marriage i mean it was it's hard for me to talk about because i i, I just want to I, I don't even want to think about it in my head i just want to pretend mm. some of the things i did and said at that time didn't happen and i want to pretend or just have amnesia to who i became and the way i behaved so even even just thinking about what happened during those times was difficult it's difficult for me to think about it let alone to talk about it but i know I know other people are in the same mess and it's like, I want to, I want to, if I want to leave anybody with anything today, it's like, there's a way out of the mess that you're in. It's like your mess will become your message. If you allow it to be that mm. there is hope for you. And from a point where even today, it's difficult for me to think about my behavior to having a really, really great marriage and, and wanting to help people through that path of really from being in the pits of hell to having a really, really fulfilling and great marriage. Right. Wow. So just, uh, you know, to, for like the time length on all of that, 
um, from the time you got married, I guess, to the point where you really hit rock bottom, if you will. How long was that? Oh, probably two years. Okay. And so my question, being the lady here in this conversation, what do you think kept your wife in the marriage? Commitment over convenience. Mm. And that's what I tell you. You need two things if you want to save your marriage. You need you need an attitude of commitment over convenience, and you need a man, an attitude of whatever it will take. And, mm. and I talk to people and say, I'm committed, I'm committed, I'm committed. And what they mean is they're committed as long as it's convenient. Right. And it's like the, the, the attitude that succeeds and the only attitude that would, will, will succeed is I'm committed to this over convenience. The convenience is irrelevant. A commitment over convenience. And if you really, really mean that, if you're really committed to it, and, and we're, we're a Christian couple. She took her vows. You know, she, she only stayed with me because of her vows. Yeah. She only stayed with me because she's a woman of integrity and she made she made a promise for better or for worse. And because she found herself in the worst part of that contract, she understood her obligation or, or she had not obligation, but she understood the promise that me she made and she didn't stay with me because she, she wanted this to work out. She didn't stay with me because she was madly in love with me at that point. She stayed with me because she, she was in integrity with herself. That's mm -hmm. why she stayed with me, which again, commitment over convenience. And it's about who are you, right? The question is when people, people say, how do you save your marriage? It's not, how do you save it? It's who do you have to become to save it? Who, mm -hmm. not how, Right. And she was the right person. She she had integrity and was integrity with us, was in integrity with herself. That was a massive part of it. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Now, how did you, I guess, from your perspective, how did you start making the changes and, and the changes that needed to be made to, to rectify the situation and get your marriage to where it is today? Look, at the, 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 the secret to, to, if you're in darkness right now, Right. And, and it could be marriage. And it's like if you're in a bad marriage, you're in darkness. The secret to all darkness is this. Right. It's light. It's light. So if I turn this light on, how many times out of 100 in a dark room, when I turn this light on, will the darkness disappear? A hundred times out of 100, the darkness will disappear. The secret to recovery, the secret to getting out of the darkness is light. And to put that in a practical perspective, light is shining light into your problem is speaking about it. So my, my lips, my, my tongue was tied on this matter. I, I knew that the problem was drinking. I knew that the problem was, was drug addiction. Yet I simply could not talk about it. And as long as I couldn't talk about it, then that darkness had power over me. And, and my wife, she, she'd be like, let's go to a seminar. Let's go to a conference. Let's get, you know, she would have emptied the bank account out. She would have spent every penny we had on a solution. But I know, I knew deep down inside that the problem was the drinking and I was incapable of talking about that drinking. I was incapable of doing it. And it wasn't until finally that really by the grace of God that I was able to open up to that. And I, I can tell you, that I, I know the exact moment and, and this is, it's a great example really where the marriage was healed instantaneously, spontaneous recovery of the marriage. It wasn't until I was able to actually open up and speak about what I was doing that the darkness dissipated. So confessing what you're doing it is the way to shine light into it you've got to speak it out and you've got to own what you're doing you've got to you've got to speak that to somebody else and then mm -hmm. you've got to continually to speak that you you've got to, you've got to seek leadership you've got to seek discipleship you've got to seek, seek accountability and you've got to seek people that have the path that you need to travel and they know the safe routes that's what you have to do mm -hmm. Yeah. And so you just mentioned spontaneous sobriety. Uh, you talk about that. Can you explain that for us? Yeah. Well, also, all sobriety is spontaneous. It's like firing a gun, right? It's like being pregnant. You can't kind of become sober any more than you can kind of become pregnant. You are pregnant or you're not. You fired the gun yeah. or you didn't. The arrow left its bow or it didn't. And all, all sobriety is spontaneous. All sobriety is spontaneous. All, all quitting of anything is cold turkey. Mm -hmm. You're either drinking or you're not. You're either behaving badly or you're not. So I, I use spontaneous sobriety. It's kind of, it's kind of like, it's an interesting term because it gets people's, people's attention, right? But the point is, you, it, it's when you get to that point, the sobriety becomes, becomes spontaneous or the healing of the marriage becomes spontaneous because... Every, everything else has left you at that point. The reason to drink has left you or the reason to fight or the reason to cause the trauma within the marriage has left you and you understand. 
And, and essentially, look, it, it's miraculous. I mean, only only God can set you free from these things. Only mm-hmm. God can set you free. And I can't leave that out of my story. The healing in my marriage was from God. The healing in my marriage was from God. Uh, in, in my drinking was from God. And it's like, look, look look at the story I've just told, right? It was my wife's commitment to being a godly woman that healed that marriage. Had she not had that commitment, had she followed, followed a secular belief system, she had every reason to leave me. I, I, I couldn't have folded her. I could not have made a case for her to stay. I, I was a bad husband. I mean, I, I was everything other than physically abusive. And, and if you ask her, she probably would have preferred physical abuse to the, the, the mental torment that I put her through. She probably mm-hmm. would have taken that. So it was, it was only her commitment to her Christ-centeredness and her commitment to her integrity to save that marriage. It wasn't anything she did or wasn't anything I did. It was her commitment to being Christ-centered. And when the time came, it was my commitment to follow that path as well. If you if you are genuinely sincere about finding your way out of your problems, a path will be presented to you. A path will be presented to you. The question is, are you going to take it? Right. That's the only question. And and people who say, well, I've been praying for this and I've been praying for that, and God hasn't made a way. No, He hasn't made your way. He hasn't made your way. Is what is what you're saying. He. Prayers are answered. There's only three answers to prayer, right? Yes, not right now. I've got something better for you. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> and all three of those answers are great. The answer is yes, not right now. I've got something better for you. But you've got to, you've got to be open to that. You've got to you've got to listen, and you've got to you've got to become a passenger in the process. And that's a wonderful thing because I was exhausted, and it wasn't until I finally wanted to stop driving the car and become a passenger that I was able to recover. As long as I was driving the process. I was just leading us to a very bad place. As soon as I just surrendered and said, I can't do this anymore. I'm ready to do it a different way now. I'm ready to do it your way now. The path became clear and the obedience to that path produced spontaneous healing for sure. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. And it's, it's an interesting concept too, the the way that you explain that, because I I didn't think of it that way, but I guess, I guess it's really the only way that you can quit something is you're quitting in a moment and, because you, you wouldn't say to somebody, I, yeah, I've been sober seven days. I was sober on the eighth. I was sober on the twelfth. I was, you know, it would it, it would start at a point. And so, no, it make, makes perfect sense when you put it that way. But okay, awesome. I appreciate that explanation. Uh, well, so so I guess looking back at that, and you know, when you made that decision to quit, what was it that for for you at least, and maybe from some of the other people that you spoke to, because I know you you know you share what you've learned and help other people to you know follow that same path. What are some of the things that make it difficult for people to stop drinking? They're, they're asleep. They're unaware of what's causing the drinking. So we're also deceived. So from, I mean, what, watch, watch, watch your television tonight and see if you can't, see if you can find a television show where, where alcohol is not portrayed. Like you, you've been taught and you've been told consciously and subconsciously, if you want to be a powerful, strong, sexually attractive alpha male, um, liquor is the way to that. And if you if you want to be if you want to be a a, 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 a top tier alpha male, you're not drinking beer. What are you drinking, right? You you watch the, the the high powered men in movies, the men that have the sexual appeal, the men that have the 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 top tier women, the men that, that that have the power and control. They're not drinking. They're not drinking beer. That they're drinking powerful liquor. They're drinking whiskey. They're they're drinking eighty proof, ninety proof, hundred proof liquor. That that. It's going to get, I mean, that, that was one of the things for me. I was drinking beer for the most part, and I was starting to move in, into more serious whiskey and, and, and other stuff like that. And I'm like, well, this alcohol is, is, is or this beer is 6%, 5% alcohol. This whiskey is 40 to 50% alcohol. I'm like, if this stuff gets a hold, if, if I'm struggling with this stuff at 5% and this stuff gets a hold of me at 50%, what hope have I got? Mm-hmm. What hope have I got? And, and you, like, we, we all ultimately, as men, like in the same way that every woman has the same need, every woman ultimately has the same need. They want to be here, seen, heard, and understood. We, we, we need to be the alpha male. We need to be sexually attractive to women. We need to feel powerful. We need to feel in control. And we're told that through subliminal and conscious advertising and marketing that alcohol is the way to do that. If you're going to be a strong, powerful, sexually attractive alpha, alpha male, you should be drinking whiskey. And they, they, they put it in those glistening 
crystal glasses with the eyes <laughs> shimmering and like but the reality is the stuff in that glass is the same stuff that you you go to your gas pump and put in your car it's ethanol the only difference between the ethanol that you put in your car to run your car and the ethanol in that crystal glass with the shimmering ice is they put some chemicals in there so it doesn't kill you mm. that that's the truth that's the reality of the situation they've had to put a bunch of chemicals in there to make it to where it doesn't kill you and the taste is not so terrible that you can get it down yet we flock to it why is it because they've tapped into that primeval core need to be powerful sexual and, and uh, desirable to women so that that's just one example of many right of many uh, that this is what we're told we need to be doing as men but it's not what we need to be doing if we want to be a man we need to be leading our wives if we want to be a man we need to be creating emotional security for our wives if we want to be a man we need to be creating financial security we need to be creating a blanket we need to be creating a, a home of peace and prosperity a place of sanctuary to where whatever happens in this house this is a place or whatever happens out in the world this home is a place of sanctuary mm -hmm. my wife can come into my home at any time and find sanctuary in our home because it's a place of peace that's what the, that's what a real man does that's what makes you desirable to a woman that's what makes you attractive to a woman it's not going out and drinking whiskey and in fact, quite the opposite. I mean, the, the, the whiskey will do everything to destroy that. If you're drinking, you, there's no way you can. You, the, I, I'll tell you the story if you want to hear it in a little bit about the moment of sponta some spontaneous recovery for me and my wife. There are three things. Look, is it all right if I share that story, actually? Because I of think course. So there are three things that you need for a happy for a happy marriage, right? You need emotional safety and security. You need mutual ad ad mutual admiration and respect, and you need a shared vision and goal. Which, looking at you guys, hats off to you. You're on here doing this interview together, podcast together. You have at least one shared vision and goal together. <laughs> you cracked that, right? It ha the, the, the first part is emotional safety and security. And, and I'll ask your lovely wife here. I mean, how, how, how can you feel emotionally safe and secure if your husband is a demon because the drink's in? Yeah. If you don't no, know, yeah. you don't know who's going to show up. Exactly. Is it the Cody that's going to love me or is it the Cody that's going to beat the living crap out of me emotionally today? Mm -hmm. If I tell him this, is he going to respond to it or is he going to take it and turn it around and beat me with it? It's like I, I, I talk to men and they go, my, my wife just doesn't like talking. I'm like, that, that, that's like every woman likes talking. What she, what she is saying is she doesn't like talking to you, is what mm. she, which means she doesn't have a much, enough emotional safety to open up and it's, it's it's more painful to talk to you than to not so for her not to talk to you is immensely painful but that should tell you something because she's choosing that over talking to you so you need that emotional safety and security you need that mutual admiration and respect you guys clearly have respect for each other H how can you have a relationship without mutual admiration and respect impossible mm -hmm. any relationship business relationship relationship with your employee employer uh, employer employees customers friends Think of one relationship that you have that's healthy that does not have mutual admiration and respect. Essential. And then the shared vision and goal. So what happened with me was I was, I was up in my roof. I had a, a loft and uh, I, I was into some pretty core cool drug use. I'm talking like not, not marijuana and stuff like that. I'm talking like hardcore addiction, pipes, rocks, stuff like that. And I'd, I'd go up in the roof and I'd be smoking stuff like i don't even want to talk about what it was it was bad right it was not like i'm up there relaxing with a joint i was not i was getting i was getting strung out on some seriously addictive stuff and i was drinking drinking my booze and every 20 minutes i'd go up there and she's like what are you doing up there i said oh, i'm just playing with my toys i've got some hobbies and i'd go up there and i'd smoke a rock and drink some beer and that that went on for years years and I, i'd hide it from her but one day i was just up there and i'm like desperate to get out of this situation just in bondage and chains i mean i did not want to be going up there i mean it was it was painful and i i so badly wanted out and i so badly wanted to be set free and what i just said came to me the, the thing about the light shine light into it cody shine light into it so she was in the shower i went downstairs I, I went downstairs and she was in the shower and i opened it up i said i need to talk to you and and with the shower water still running she goes what is it i said you want to know what I'm doing up in the roof? I'm up there getting drunk and smoking crack is what I'm doing. That's what's going on. And she just looked at me and she goes, 
Thank you. I appreciate you sharing that with me. And we're going to get through this together. And it's like, what, what, what just happened there, right? What just happened? She, she created the emotional safety and security for me to continue. She could have gone, what the hell do you think you're doing? Mm -hmm. Emotional safety and security gone. <laughs> emotional safety and security gone. I'm like, right, well, I'll, I'll be in the garage then. I'm not going to open the roof anymore because you're onto me for that. So I'll go smoke in the garage or whatever. So by saying, uh, you know, I love you and, and I appreciate you telling me that and we're going to get through this together. Emotional safety and security immediately created for the conversation to continue. Like what did it do for my respect for her? Immediate respect for her response. What did it do for her respect for me? Immediate respect for, the, for owning it. She could have gone, she could have, she could have responded to that a hundred different ways. None of them did. And then the final result was like, we're going to get through this together. What is, what is that? What is getting through this together? What did we just create in that moment? We created, we created a, a, a common vision and goal for the relationship. So in, in the snap of a finger, in the snap of a finger, Emotional safety and security was restored. Mutual admiration and respect, respect was established and a common vision and goal for the relationship was created. Like that, literally like that. Three minutes, it's done. And that was the turning point of my life. That was the turning point of our marriage. We never looked back after that. Things got better. Within probably three months, I was clean over all of that stuff and, and moving, moving forward. And it's the same for anybody. It's like... If you want to heal your marriage, if you want to heal your relationship, if you want to heal your relationship with your kids, emotional safety and security, mutual admiration and respect, common vision for the relationship. The, how long does it take to heal? The question is, how long does it take to establish those pillars of a great relationship? That is, that is the answer to the question, how long does it take? Yeah, and that, you know, and I think every, every situation is different. And, you know, listening to you, I'm thinking your wife, right? Another piece to add to that is action. So you have that shared goal of where you want to get to. And she comes along, you know, and is there to support in some people's situations, it's the husband. But then also to me, I, I want to see the action. I want to see you putting in that work to, you know, get to continue on that road to get to the goal. And when people, yeah, when people don't see that, that's when I think people are like the, you know, the spouse is like, okay, here we go again. Right. Or, you know, I trusted, I put all my faith, blah, 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 blah. And the next thing you know, we're back here at square one. So that's also that, um, being vulnerable and hold, holding, you know, your spouse accountable too. Right. Absolutely. And look, there's, there's really two aspects to that. You're absolutely, you bring up some really good points there. That, that's very insightful because like when, when you're in the recovery process, it's not the 99 things you do right. It's the one thing you do wrong because your, your number one enemy at this point is confirmation bias. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Your wife, if, if you've been the husband that I was for many years, confirmation bias is working against you right now. She, she has, she has a bias to your behavior and it's like, right. It's not the 99 things that you do right. It's the one thing that you do wrong. It's like, we, that's what I'm saying. It's, this is about commitment over convenience. If this is about, will you do, are you willing to do whatever it takes? Because this is, this is not something you could, you can't half ass your way to success. Yeah. This is not the 70% rule, right? 70% is a passing grade. It's like, no, no, no. Passing grade is a hundred, my brother. <laughs> passing grade is a hundred. That that's that's for sure. You gotta understand that. And that's you gotta you gotta understand where your, your wife is coming from because she's not you can't just go, Well, I've made the change, so therefore you need to accept me as the changed person. It's like, no, no, no. It's like if you if you're hundred pounds overweight, nobody's gonna believe you're gonna stop eating and change that diet till you've lost 50, 60 pounds or 30 or 40 pounds. When you're 30, 40 pounds into it, and people see that your 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 body's changing and your attitude's changing and you're no longer the habits are changing, then they're going to start to go, hmm, might be something to this. <laughs> might be something to this. But this is where there was a, there was a study done, uh, the, the, the change or die study, which is, this, is, this is really useful for people looking to change. They had a group, they had two groups of people, both of them were in a change or die situation. I believe it was, I believe it was heart disease was the situation and they were literally in a life or death, change your life or die situation. And they had a group that had no support. They, they, they wanted to do it on their own. They were going to change their lifestyle on their own. 
Uh, only 10% of that group in a, in, a, in a life or death, literally change your life or die situation, actually managed to make the changes over a consistent 12-month period. Wow. The second group, which had accountability, support, and coaching, 77% of that group made changes that were meaningful and stuck. So uh, 700%, you're 700% more likely to make the change with accountability. Now, I, I, I call it discipleship. The number one thing, like when I when I talk to men, so I, I, you know, from a business perspective, I work with men, right? That's who I work with. So I'm talking to men. It's like, how do you change your life? Discipleship. You need to get into discipleship. You need to become discipled. Like in the world, we can call that accountability or, or, or whatever, but it's like you are simply by submitting to discipleship, you are 700% more likely to achieve the result. And if you submit to discipleship, if you, if you are willing to make a commitment and back that up with, with action and back it up with something that costs you, like what is, what is your, how, how is your wife going to perceive that? How is your wife going to perceive that? If you just go, I'm going to make the change. Like, well, well, how, how are you going to make the change? I didn't want to be drunk. I didn't want to be, you know, up in the roof smoking crack. I didn't want to be a bad husband. I didn't want any of that stuff. I didn't, that wasn't the vision that I had for my life. I just, there was a hole in the road. I didn't see it. I fell down it and I find myself in a labyrinth of caves and I'm lost. Very few people actually set out in life to say, I'm going to be a terrible husband and a crackhead. Very, very few kids have that vision. <laughs> Very few people have that vision. But when you find yourself in, in that place, it's, it's you know, the number one thing. Like, when I ask people, how will, will this work for me? Well, let, let me ask you this question. Like, how humble are you? How much humility do you have? Are, are you willing to say I made a mess of my life? Are you willing to say I don't know the way? Are you willing to say I'm lost? Are you willing to submit to discipleship? Are you willing to do the hard yards? You know, I, I, I do coaching calls with clients, and I, like, I'll be on – I'll be on a call with them when, when we're kind of evaluating whether it's the right thing or not. And they say, well, what time are the coaching calls? Wrong question. What does it matter? What does it matter? I'm like, you just said that you're committed to commitment over convenience. And your next question is what time are the calls? Is sleep going to take you out of the game, brother? <laughs> if you have to get up, I, I got on airplanes. I got on airplanes and flew around the world to solve my problems. On the off chance, I, I got on airplanes on the off chance that somebody had the solution. And it's like, you, your question is, what time are coaching calls? It's like, call me, call me in, in a year when the pain is bit bad enough. But, you know, it's like people will choose food over success. They're 100% committed until they have to miss a meal. They're 100% committed till they have to get up in the middle of the, they're They're 100% committed till they have to get their, 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 their wallet out and... and invest in themselves they're 100 it's like it's like my wife said i was talking to her the other day and she goes anybody can have this but you've got to want it more than you want anything else mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's what it boils down to you will get yeah. what you want my brother and my sister you will get what you want in your life 100 percent. but the question is do you, what what you have right now is what you want more than any i guarantee you know i can tell you guys looking at you you're a happy cover i guarantee that didn't show up by accident no, that's true. Lots of work. I guarantee, it works. I guarantee it. You know, it's like what you get. Everybody gets what they want. You want yeah. sleep, have it. You want your meal, have it. Whatever you want. You want your new car, your vacation, have it. But understand, you've made that choice. Yeah. So it's, it's about getting real. You got to get clear about what you want, and then decide. This is what I want. Am I willing to pay the price? And it's not just a financial price. It's like. You're going to have to sacrifice yourself. You're going to have to sacrifice your own beliefs. You're going to have to sacrifice your own vision of the world, your own worldview. There's a lot of sacrifices to be made, for sure. Mm -hmm. And, you know, with that, right, like I totally agree with, you know, um, commitment over convenience, right? But the thing is, and I, I think where people struggle is that, like, what does that look like in the be in between, and that's where you come up with like all the, like the sacrifice, everything you have to do to confirm that you stick with that commitment piece and not just what's easiest. Because we all know like what's hard, we typically naturally run away from, right? Exactly. Because 
life, let's be real, can is already hectic and can be stressful enough. You know, you add kids to the mix and work and all that. And then you still have to work on all this other stuff that we all thought was going to be easy. And <laughs> right. And that's when it's like, oh, my word, you know, like you got to put that time in getting on a call with somebody or what, what have you. But I think that's just for our society. That's where the struggle lies of really sacrificing, like you say, like you're sacrificing pretty much your, yourself. You're putting your needs down to, you know, reach that better goal, the better good for uh, like for your marriage, right? A a absolutely. And it's like the whole self-sacrifice is a selfless act, right? I, or, or, or it's a selfish act. I call it selfish benevolence. Mm. It's selfish benevolence. If I sacrifice for my, for my wife, who wins? We both do. If I sacrifice my wife for myself, who wins? Neither of us do. And it's about, you know, the, the first shall be last, the winners shall be losers, the losers shall be winning. Win. Everything that you think you know is wrong, right? That's the only conclusion that I can come to. When we look at Western society, what you know, what is right about Western society? Highest drug use in, in the world, highest divorce rates, highest suicide rates, highest mental illness, highest, 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 highest. Nothing good has come out of Western society. Nothing good. So why do we adopt those views? Why do we continue? It's like when we look at the 50% of marriages end in divorce, but it's worse than that. When you, when you survey the other 50% and say, how many of you are actually happy? 90 some percent of those say we're not happy. So it's, they, they've stayed together for the kids. They've stayed together for their finances. They've stayed together for their welfare they've, uh, or for their, for, their, for their wealth. They've stayed together for uh, the sake of anything other than happiness. So you're looking at like probably 95% of marriages are uh, in, in, in chaos right now, in trauma, yeah. unsatisfied, un unsatisfied, unhealthy, unhappy, unfulfilled. 90 plus percent of marriages are in that state, yet we still continue down the path of Western values that we're, we're told this is how you be a husband, this is how you be a wife. I mean, like everything I knew about being a husband was wrong. Everything about what being a man was is wrong. The things that I were told that being a man is, is wrong. It's like be, being the guy in college that can drink the most, right? Yeah, that, that's real manly behavior. That's what being a real man is, being able to, 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 to drink the most amount of beer in college or whatever. It's like, and that just goes on and on and on and on and on. I mean, that's just an example, right? Everything that I was told about what it takes to be a man was wrong. And it's like, my, my desire was to be a man. As all of us, I wanted to be sexually attractive to women. I wanted to be powerful. I wanted to be strong. I wanted to command the space around me. I wanted to be the alpha male. And and bottom line is, like, we all did. We all want that. Every man desires that. Every man craves that. Some men are honestly, honest about it. Some men are not. But it's what we crave. And I'm, and I'm looking at what society is telling me as what an alpha male is. The first 10 years of my, of my experience of work was climb the corporate ladder. Climb the corporate ladder, climb the corporate, be a manager, be a, uh, a regional manager, be a regional vice president, become a vice president, make more money, make more money, make more money, have have a bigger house, have a nicer car, have a yada, yeah, da, da. this is what being a man is, this is what being an alpha male is, this is what being sexually attractive is. Misery. Misery came out of that. You, you, could, you couldn't put me back into that situation for $10 million a year. I would say, no, I'm, I'm, thank, I'm all right, Jack. <laughs> I'm good. Everything I was told about what it takes to be a real man was a lie. Everything I was told about what women want is a lie. It led to alcoholism. It led to drug addiction. It led to misery, depression, anxiety, stress, every negative possible condition that our disease society has. I had it. And why? Because I, I believed the lies that this is what it takes to be a man. And when finally I was able to acknowledge that in my, in my attempt to be a man, all I've managed to do is create a spoiled little boy and confess that and then find somebody who was a real man and submit myself to their discipleship. And the, and the answer to, to falling back, you know, backsliding and falling back is you've got to find someone that you respect so much, you, you'd rather cut your right pinky finger off than let them down. Right. You, you, now, you, you, 
you'd rather do anything than let that person down because you value their respect so much that you are going to follow through on your that, that that's what it takes bit of a rant so, there. <laughs> so 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 i'm curious now because you you brought up a couple of things there and talk about like the the corporate culture and trying to be successful in that culture why is it that you know that culture that you know that just pushing for success or being successful really really manifests that uh, that addiction uh, mentality well it's because like it's what we need we need to be appreciated like I, as a man do you need to be appreciated do you need respect like I, I talk to couples in crisis all the time and the one thing i hear is like i my wife doesn't respect me. My wife doesn't respect me. My wife doesn't respect I, over and over again. I needed to respect me. And it's like, well, produce, produce some behavior, brother, that's respect worthy. Produce some behavior that's respect worthy. It's like you just sitting there going, respect me, bitch. It's like, I don't respect you. That That is literally what men are saying. Respect me, bitch. Respect me, bitch. It's like, you better show me some respect, bitch. It's like, that's 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 a, that's a real man right there. Mm. that's a real man it's like respect my car respect my bling respect my money and it's like it, it manifests itself over all aspects of society like obviously I, i'm kind of having a pop at the rapper culture here right but it's exactly the same in the corporate culture it's like respect my wine collection respect my vacations respect my car res res respect my watch respect my, my my gucci suit respect my it's exactly the same in every aspect of, of, but a man wearing a suit, the suit does not make the man. Yeah. Drive, driving a car does not make you a man. And it's like, why does this happen? It's because it benefits the corporation for you to believe that. Mm -hmm. Consumerism benefits the corporation. If you, if you believe wholeheartedly that by rising to the top of the corporate ladder, by sacrificing every aspect of your life, I mean, when I look back and think some of the things that I did to, to rise up the corporate ladder, unreal it's unreal i mean it's literally I, I i sacrificed my life for that corporation i said my life will be this corporation and they demanded that of me and as soon as i said i want some of my life back they cut they cut the ties right it benefits the corporation if you sacrifice your entire life for their growth under the false promise that if you do that if you sacrifice yourself entirely and you give yourself entirely to us for 10 years you will have the elements that make you an alpha male and you'll be sexually attractive. You'll be powerful. You'll be respected. It, it's men are deceived that they're following. And, and it's the same for women too. Like women, women create the same things. They're given, they, it's just a different path, right? I'm a man and I can speak to what men want. You know, your wife obviously can speak to women much more because I'm not one. But when you, are, when you think that that's what it's going to take to make you an alpha male, you're going to sacrifice everything to achieve that. Everything. And when you get there, when you arrive at that point and you realize that, A, I'm not an alpha male, and B, like, I haven't got It's like, we wonder why we drink, right? We've been told that we should be drinking. Like, oh, I mean, they, they are, the irony is that there was a study done that of all drugs, legal, illegal, prescription, how damaged, you know, get, given an overall rating, danger rating, right, for Danger to yourself, danger to society, danger to, to your family, stuff like that. What, what are the most destructive drugs? Alcohol, I think it was alcohol got like a 77, was number one with a, a rating of 77. Number two was crack cocaine at like 59. Wow. As, as overall damage into society, right? Like alcohol was was number one by, by leaps and bounds, yet it is the only drug we have to justify not taking. Mm -hmm. It's no, nobody thinks about that. It's like I tell people I don't drink, and they're like, "Why not? Why do I have to justify taking the most dangerous?" You know, you go out to you go out to a, a you know, I'll go to bars with friends because I'm not like one of these people that you shouldn't drink. I'm like make make an informed decision, but they're like, "Why don't you just drink in moderation, Cody?" You know, it's like nobody goes no nobody goes to McDonald's and and, and orders a salad, and then the person that they're with them goes, "Well, why don't you just why, why are you ordering a salad? Why don't you just order a Big Mac and and order it in moderation?" It's like, <laughs> it's true. Alcohol is literally the only substance, the only drug that we have to justify not taking, yet it is the most harmful. And, and where I'm going with this, so I can bring it back to a cohesive point, is we're told all the way along the journey of becoming that alpha male that, that 
drinking is a significant part of that in high school, right? The popular kids drink. In college, the popular <laughs> kids drink. In, in, in film culture, in Hollywood culture, the powerful men drink. In, in that corporate culture, it's a, it's a culture of drinking. And then you arrive at that pinnacle and you realize that it's not a pinnacle at all and you've just got this drinking habit and you're empty. Why not drink some more? It's not, it's not difficult, right? It, it's when you just discard all of that and go, I've been lied to. I've been utterly lied to by society and I reject all of it and I don't care. If I have to drink to be an alpha male, I'll be a beta male. If I have to sell my life to the corporation or join the military and, and lose an arm or a leg to be an alpha male, I'll be a beta male. That's fine. <laughs> I'm all right with that. No, it's interesting too because I, personally, um, I don't drink myself as well. And I, you know, if I'm at an event for work or something, and I, I just say like, I don't drink, or I, you know, t typically people respect that. I, I find actually the the more pushback I get, or the more questions I get, are from other Christians. <laughs> it's something that's kind of an interesting dynamic to me when I, yeah. you know, when I speak to one of my friends who isn't a Christian, and I say I don't drink, they just kind of respect it and assume it's part of my faith, and then. The other crowd is a little bit, but yeah, but it, but it is an interesting point. It's really the one thing that you do have to kind of justify why you don't do it. Uh, kind of want to um, shift focus and something that's been bugging me a little bit is, you know, when you talk about the addictions that you struggled with at any point, did your wife have any suspicions that this was the case? Because I know I've heard stories of people who have been, None. Uh, Sam, Samuel L. Jackson comes to mind. I know for, for a long time, he was a, uh, he was a functioning drug addict. He would go to work every day, go, you know, act, uh, but did she ever suspect anything at all with you? Nothing. Absolutely not. She had no idea. Oh, wow. It was a complete shock to her. Look, when, when you're a serious drug addict, when, when, you, when you have a serious drug habit, you will go to great lengths to protect that because like, the, the worst thing in the world would be a situation arising where that habit couldn't be exercised. Mm -hmm. that, that's completely un unacceptable. So it's like, it's the, it's the ultimate crime, right? You, you, you're going to, you're going to, hide your path you're going to hide all trails to it and make sure that it's not discovered because if it is discovered it makes it that much harder to indulge in and you're going to indulge in it you're going to engage in it so uh no i, I was able to hold that uh, hide that secret for for uh, until i came out and told her simply because one like drinking is is socially acceptable so i'll give you i'll give you an example so i would take a flask of vodka you know the little the little flask you can get or, or a one pint bottle of vodka and we go. To, I'd wear a jacket with an inside pocket, and I put a little bottle of vodka, a pint of vodka, in that pocket. And we go to like a family dinner, and I'd order a beer or two beers at the at the table, which is completely socially acceptable. Nobody's going to question you order a bit ordering a beer. And then I would go into the toilet, and I down a pint of vodka in the toilet. And then I'd come back and quick glass, quick swig of beer, to take the the strong alcohol out of my mouth. And then I'd sit there and. I could hold it together like I, I was an experienced drinker like i wasn't a, a 14 year old drinking for the first time i could hold it together so i'd have my two beers and then at the end of the night i'd just tell my wife because she never drank really I, i'm not i'm feeling a bit tired could you possibly drive us home so i, I just consumed a pretty decent amount of alcohol in that restaurant and and to the world they just seen that it was a socially acceptable amount they had literally no idea of how much i was drinking and that's just one example. I mean, I, I, I would, I'd become very smart with it and I'd be very, become very smart at hiding it as well, for sure. Mm -hmm. So no, to answer well, your question, she had no idea. Um, oh, sorry, were you going to go? You, you can go ahead. I, 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 did have a, I did have a question, but we'll, we'll, get, we'll get to mine. My, I was just wanting to go forward. So you said, you know, it took around three months to really start to see change. How did things look, and I guess it's not fair to put a number on it, but like as you to continue to go down this journey of like healing and just sobriety and you know all that, like what did that look like? So it was like, again, like I've got to give a lot of credit to my wife. She didn't hold the past against me. She she knew the time. Like now, don't get me wrong. Like it comes, it, 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 there's a time, and there's still there's still discussions to be had, right? There are still things that happen that need to be talked about. Like she needs the trauma to be released as well, but she just she she, mm -hmm. she understands. Like she she's quite, what's the word? Intuitive in understanding that when is the time to have this conversation? Right. When is the time to have this conversation? Because sometimes, like. 
very rarely are two people giving the same amount in the relationship at the same time. Sometimes you're giving your your husband needs you to give more than he can give back. And sometimes you need to give more than she can give back. And it's like, we're carrying each other, right? Sometimes you're carrying your husband and sometimes he's carrying you. So I think at that point, she understood that like going in and, and, and talking about stuff that, or, or forcing those conversations that I really probably wasn't ready to have, wasn't the time to have it. So in that respect, she was carrying me by allowing those conversations to be deferred to a later day for sure. Which, which, allowed, which facilitated the healing as well. Because again, emotional safety and security, right? It goes both ways. Yeah. A woman needs it more than the man needs it, but the man needs it as well. So if she was damaging the emotional safety and security by putting me in a position of making me talk about stuff I couldn't or wasn't willing to talk about, we're really, we're damaging the first pillar of the, the, the restoration process, which is rebuilding that emotional safety and security. So it's a case of... Um, we, we had this agreement, we did talk about it, and it's like, when I say I don't want to talk about this, you've got to drop it. You've got to drop it. Like, if I tell you I, I don't want to talk about this, that that means I don't want to talk about this. And if you continue to push it, um, I'm not going to talk about it, but the only, if the only way I can not talk about it is to have an explosion, that is going to happen. If you try to push somebody to talk about something they're not ready to talk about, they will pull the pin on the hand grenade as a distraction. Right. So we, yeah. we had that conversation. And even now, like uh, we've, we've got these triggers in, in the marriage where if there are times when I'll just walk out and I've told her ahead of time, so I'm not when I leave, I'm not walking out on you. I'm walking out because I recognize my own limitations and I recognize that I'm about to say something that's going to be much harder to repair than me walking out. So if we're having a heated discussion, I say I'm out. I just get raised my hand. If I just go, I'm out. I'm out of here. I'm not leaving you. I'm protecting you. Right. That's not an act of abandonment. That's an act of protection because I am still human. I do have limits. I do have a temper. I do, and it can be triggered, right? So, but the, I have an awareness now that I didn't have before. I'm able to be aware of where I'm at in the process. It's like if I'm getting close to losing control, I'm not going to let. I'm not going to cross that line. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna. I'm gonna leave the situation, and I tell her. When I do that, I'm not leaving you. I'm protecting you, and I will be back. That that's a, that's an act of love, not an act of abandonment. Yeah, and she understands that, right? So, whereas uh, if I just walked out, as I did previously, if I just get to a point where, ah, oh, you know, screw this, I'm out of here. It's like that's abandonment. Like, how 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 is she going to feel secure? How is she going to feel safe? How is she going to be feel protected if if when things get tough, tough, you abandon her, right? And I know as a man, you're probably thinking what I'm thinking. It's like, I'm not abandoning you. I'm protecting you. But how does she know that? She she doesn't think like you. If you walk out, like what would another woman, if two women were in that situation and another woman just stood up and walked off, what would that mean? That's how you've got to see it. Mm -hmm. She's processing she's processing your behaviors as though you was a woman, not as a man, if that makes sense. She, she's looking at your behavior and going, okay, if I did that, what would that mean? Well, I would never just walk out on a situation. So if I walked out on a situation, that would be it. I'd be done. I'd be over. That's the only way I would walk out. And that's how they process it. So you've got to have those fail safes. You've got to, you've got to recognize your limitations. You've got to recognize where you are as a human. And, and you've got to communicate with that what your wife. And you've got to have those fail safes. Here's what's going to happen, sweetie. Here's how we protect ourselves from doing more damage. I'm a loose cat. I'm a monkey with a machine gun when I lose my temper. <laughs> <laughs> it's ugly. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah. It, you know, it's interesting you say that. I used to co-facilitate a group for abusive men. And that was like one of the things that we would teach them is timeouts. But how you have to introduce that to your spouse, right? It's not just, oh, I'm taking a timeout, but there's like, there's nothing to go with it. Like, <laughs> Is that like when you leave, are, are you going to the bar? Like, when are yeah. you going to be back? Right. All that kind of stuff. But you have those conversations when things are good. Like if I, if I call it whatever tea, whatever, know that I'm doing this for myself to keep you safe, however that will look. Right. Yeah. But I'm going to be back. And so when you say, yeah. you know, that keeps her safe and like just emotionally and all that kind of stuff, it makes so much sense. Yeah. And it's, my, it's minor tweaks, right? It's minor tweaks to philosophy. Yeah. It's like these are small hinges that swing big doors. Yep. 
And this is why accountability and coaching is really so important because like you could get this, you could be so close to getting this right, but get it wrong and you're going to do a lot of damage. Yeah. Like if you, if you don't get this right and you don't have the proper conversation with your wife and you get the acknowledgements and, and they understand what's going on, it's like your wife, if you just walk out when things get heated, it's like she's not going to be able to depend on you. She's going to think, well, what is he just going to leave when things get tough? If mm-hmm. things get bad, is he just going to walk out? And it's like two people that are wanting the same things, two people that are walking, moving towards the same goals, ultimately they're going to end up separating irreconcilably, irreconcilably because – minor differentiations in philosophy have not been pointed out it's 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 you know the difference between getting algebra right and getting it wrong is the, is, is a decimal place in one in one number that's it you, you can get the smallest amount you can get 99 percent of the equation right and get the tiniest amount wrong and you're going to get the wrong answer yeah and that's why you know the discipleship is so important you've got to find somebody who understands where the landmines are they understand where the pitfalls are because they've you know, someone that's got one leg is a good person to to, to mentor you, right? Because they've stepped on a landmine. They know where it is. It's like, don't go over there. <laughs> Been there, done that. <laughs> yeah, let me tell you, it hurts, my brother. It hurts. Learn the easy way. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Now, so I, I kind of want to uh, shift focus to the mistakes to avoid. And I'm sure we've covered some of it just naturally in the conversation, but the mistakes that are going to permanently destroy your marriage but let's talk about those so it's really it's about you've got to understand the three pillars emotional safety and security mutual admiration respect and shared vision and goal so you have everything you have people say communication is the key to a marriage okay well that's fine that's true to some extent but again differentiation is like you know calling you an f and a hole is communication right <laughs> <laughs> True. Doesn't, <laughs> make, doesn't make you want me back on the podcast as a guest again. It doesn't produce the outcome. <laughs> so what the number one thing really when it comes to communication, the real skill is what people remember. You, you won't remember any of this interview a year from now apart from how you felt during it. You'll remember almost nothing that I said, like 99% of this. you you remember a few key points as will I. But most, the, the vast majority will be d- deleted, distorted, or generalized in your mind. The vast majority of it will be gone. But what will accurately remain is how you felt during this interview. And vice versa, what will remain from this is how I felt. That is what's remembered, is, is, is the feeling. So the, the effective communication starts with asking the question of, how is this piece of communication impacting how this person feels? Because I, I, I can say something to try and help you, but it comes across as being an attack, right? And you feel attacked. Mm-hmm. Right. The best of intention was to the outcomes, right? And so the, the, when it comes to communication, you've got, you've got to ask yourself, for every piece of communication, how is this impacting how my partner is feeling? And how is that impacting the three key pillars? How is that impact? Because you can be right. You can be absolutely 100% right in your communication, but it's impacting emotional safety and security. And if that's if that's what's happening, don't do it. That that's the biggest mistake. People don't look at their communication in terms of how is it impacting the supporting pillars of my marriage. They're just they're looking at their communication in a, in a very short term. How does it impact this conversation, or how does this uh, support my view or make me right? I mean, one of the things we talk about is is case building, right? One of the absolutely destructive habits in a, in a marriage is case building building your case. Are you listening to your partner to try and understand them, to hear them and to validate them? Or are you listening to build your case? Because in an environment where a case is being built, there's a winner and a loser. If you're building a case, like a court case, there's a winner and a loser in a court case, right? Mm -hmm. If you want to make your case, fine, make your case. But let me ask you a question, brother. Do you want to be right or do you want to be married? What's more important to you? And, And when you're looking at creating that piece of communication and passing it on to your wife. Like what is the purpose of this communication? Is it to build, is it, is it the egoic self? Are you trying to support the egoic self and and, and build the ego up and prove the ego, right? By building a case. And in the process of that, you, you make her feel attacked. You make her feel belittled. You make her feel wrong. You make her feel small. You destroy emotional safety and security, but you're right. And maybe you are right. Maybe you are valid in your argument. But, you know, look at the cost of that being right. Look at the cost. Or, or 
are you willing to s sacrifice that ego and go, okay, well, what does my wife need at this point? She, she needs to be heard. She needs to be understood. She doesn't need me to justify my position and tell her why I did it. She just needs to, me to understand how it made me feel. It's like, very, again, minor tweaks in philosophy, right? Minor tweaks, but these are big hinges. These are small hinges that swing big doors. We want, we want compressed time frames. We want disproportionate results to effort. We're all busy people. None of us have got time, and we don't want to spend hours and hours and hours and days and weeks and years learning stuff, right? We want compressed time frames. We want small hinges that swing big doors, and we want disproportionate results to effort. And when we put all of those things together, it's the minor tweaks. It's the minor tweaks. Like, it doesn't take much to make a woman happy. All you got to do is show your mouth. The knot. <laughs> <laughs> That's all it takes, brother. That's all it takes. She just wants you. She just wants you to shut your mouth and nod. That's it. It's like she doesn't want. I mean, we we complicate it so much. It's like we men we're, we're problem solvers, right? And we feel like the alpha male if we can solve a problem. But it's like the problem is you're trying to solve a problem. How do you solve this problem? It's the easiest solution. The the solution to this problem is the easiest thing in the world. It's be quiet. Listen. That's it. That's the, that is the solution to the problem. You don't like if you want to solve her problem, that, that is the solution. Just just listen. And if most men would do that, the different the difference in their relationship would be instantaneous. Instantaneous. <laughs> so <laughs> that's is that is that does that answer your question? That's a few that's a few mistakes that people make for sure in, in their relationship, how they how they mess it up. Yeah, for sure. So putting put putting the ego out in front. And also Absolutely. trying to problem solve when you really should just be listening. That's a, I, I know that's a big one. <laughs> exactly. Well, the fact that you, the, the solution to the problem is to listen. It's not to create a more complex solution. Because ultimately when you think about it, if your wife goes, Oh, um, I had a really bad day at work. So-and-so was really mean to me or so-and-so just does, does this all the time and blah, 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 blah. It's like, the, the tendency as a man is to go, oh, just ignore him. It doesn't mean anything. But if you think about it, what if, what have you done there? A, like you, you, you've you've completely invalidated your wife. You just told right. her yeah. her emotion is not bad. It's like a a you haven't listened. She hasn't felt listened to, heard, and understood. And B, worse than that, you've gone one step further and said, not only am I not going to listen and validate you, I'm also going to tell you that your viewpoint is not valid. Right. I'm going to tell you that your emotion is not valid. And then again, rule number one of communication, how is that piece of communication making her feel? What is that piece of communication doing to emotional security? Does she feel now more or less comfortable coming to you tomorrow telling you that she's having problems at work? Right. Just damage, 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 damage being done. But what, what, what did you do? You tried to help her. Uh, it, because if I came to you with that problem, said, oh, I'm having this problem with, with this guy at work, and you go, oh, he's just, a, he's just an a-hole, blow it off. It doesn't mean anything. I'd be like, right on, brother. <laughs> <laughs> You're exactly right. That's exactly what I needed to hear. That's, that's how men communicate. But with different species, like the whole, the feminist movement, like let, let's get really controversial now. The, no, 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 nobody has done less for women than the feminist movement. <laughs> Nobody's done less for women than, than the feminist community. The, the, the feminist movement, right? It's like it makes me laugh so much when I talk to feminists. It's like you look at this is this is just the perfect example in my mind. Like women, women and children, women in battle, right? Now you see every movie's got like shield maidens and this and that, women going into battle, like it's belittling for a woman not to go into battle. No, the reason women were not allowed into battle is because they were too freaking valuable. They were too valuable. They're the most valuable part of the community. If if they if, if if 10 women get slain in battle, that is catastrophic to the growth of that community. It, if 100 men are killed in battle and two remain, the community can be restored. <laughs> if 100 women are killed in battle and two remain, end of. Mm -hmm. It's like mm -hmm. the reason we don't allow women into battle is not because we don't think they're capable of going into battle. They're too damn valuable. They have too much work. Why do we put women and children first on lifeboats? Why do we let women and children first out of burning theaters? Because that's the most valuable asset. If your house was on fire and you could save one thing out of it, would it be the least valuable thing? 
Or would you go in there and would you pull out the most valuable thing first? We've put women and children first, not because they're frail. It's because they're too valuable. They have so much value. It's like, why on earth would you want to do away with that? <laughs> I, I like that. Yep. I, I Hey, being the only lady here, I will go with, <laughs> I appreciate that viewpoint. <laughs> yeah, don't send them in. Why would we send our most valuable, beautiful, pre precious, desirable assets into battle to be killed and mutilated? No, 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 no. This is, this is disrespecting women. This is not recognizing the value and the ability of women. This is completely ignoring the true value of a woman. This is completely ignoring the position in society of a woman. We, we get her as far away from the battle as possible because she is valuable. Send the men out to fight. They're expendable. We don't need them as much. We don't need them as much. And I'm just like, feminists, please help me out. Please. Like, <laughs> we want to help you. It's like we love women. We value women. We respect women. Don't make us disrespect respect you with your poorly thought through views. Don't, don't, like, the, the, the sexual revolution. Sex is your power. Sex is the one thing that you have that a man cannot get anywhere else and wants more than anything. If you freely give your man your sex, you have just lost all of your power. It's like, just because you can have sex freely doesn't mean you should. Doesn't mean you should, does it? It's like, of course, a woman should have the same rights to sexual autonomy and sexual freedom as a man. Of course, but just because you can doesn't mean you should. Don't go out and exercise it. It's like the 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 way you get a man to respect you and understand who you are is you withhold that because it's so valuable. You're taking your most valuable or one of your most valuable assets and you're degrading it and you're turning it into something that has no value. That's divine. It's divine. It's why God only allows it after marriage is because that aspect of you is entirely divine and you're just going to give it to everybody like it's worth nothing. It's about value. It's like what? And then the feminists want to like give it, they want, they want their women to be able to give it to everybody. It's like you're giving away your power. Don't do it. Why is a man, why is a man going to respect you when it's like, come on, girls, come on, girls. This is not thought through. We love you. We respect you. <laughs> Most men, most men, uh, you know, fall into that category, for sure. But anyway, yeah, I don't, want, I don't want to piss off a bunch of uh, <laughs> get myself cancelled. <laughs> Where's Cody going? He spoke against the feminists and got cancelled. <laughs> oh man! Oh man! Yeah, we don't want to. Definitely don't want to get you cancelled. No. <laughs> no, I think we covered some covered some great ground. Here. Yeah, we did. Um, Cody, I just want to make sure that we uh, we highlight you here. For anybody who wants to learn more, I, I've just highlighted your website, CodyButler.com. Easy enough to remember. Uh, for those who want to connect with you, for those who want to learn more, maybe get some counseling, maybe learn about your book, what are, what are the best ways to do that? Yeah, co CodyButler.com is a great place. Uh, I'm on Facebook. Uh, pretty pretty much all the usual suspects in terms of uh, in terms of uh, where you can find me, social media and stuff like that. But yeah, Co CodyButler.com is a great is a great place to get started. You, you'll get some information there. I think there's probably some free training on that site as well. So yeah, if you're a God-centered man and uh, you, you want to step up and really be the man that you know God has called you to be and you're ready to step outside of uh, the, the, the norms that society is holding you to right now because you know there's more, there's, you know there's something better for you. You just don't know how to get it. Come check me out. <laughs> I'd, love to, I'd love to give you some some tips on, on how to do that sounds good now before we let you off the hook i wanted to ask one more question as well i know you're you're not one for self-promotion but you do have a book cut the yes. bs a no-nonsense guide to happiness now after talking to you um, i actually want to know about the book now <laughs> can you can you talk to us about what is in the book <laughs> well that's good that's good so th this is my this is my journey from like Again, like this is a whole interview by itself, really. So I don't want to. <laughs> Let's just say I found myself at a place of, of I couldn't get out of bed. There was a period of time where I literally I was so depressed. I was so um, distressed, so upset, so hurt that I, I literally couldn't get out of bed. And I think weeks at a time I'd, I'd lay in bed. And, and I managed to drag myself out of that. I'd say probably a three month period. My life had completely 100% done a 180 degree turnaround to where. My friends were like, who are you? I don't know you anymore. I went from being in a series, like a lot of the pain came from failed relationships. I, I always, 
I, I always had uh, a tendency to drink and I was never very good at relationships. I'd have a relationship, I'd, I'd fall in love, I'd get my heart broken and then I'd drink. And after a series of those events, I, I just found myself really, really depressed and in another broken relationship. And I just decided, I just said enough is enough, not another day, not another hour, not another minute. Am I gonna, Am I going to put up with this? And I asked myself the question, what would I have to believe to feel this way? What would I have to believe to feel this way? What would I have to believe about myself to allow myself to get to this point? What would I have to believe about myself to allow myself to behave this way and to abuse myself in this way? What would I have to believe? And the only answer is you'd have to hate yourself, Cody. You'd have to think you you'd have to think that you were worthy of this. You would have to think that you don't deserve happiness. You would have to think that this is the best you're ever going to do. That's what you would have to believe. And then I ask myself the question, is that true? And that gets a big hell no. <laughs> hell no. That is not true. So if it's not true, I'm going to start acting like what is true? What is true? I'm a child of God. I'm divine. I'm a perfect, I'm perfect, not because anything I've done, like the God that I serve is perfect and he created me and he does not make mistakes. If, he made, if I'm not perfect, he made a mistake. The God that I can serve can only create perfection. And I have to accept that perfection and walk in it if I'm going to hold my belief as a Christian. If I believe that I ser serve a certain God, uh, a perfect God, I have no option. I have no choice but to believe in my own divinity and to believe that I am perfect. Not through anything I've done, but through the fact that I'm divinely created through the perfect. And if that's true, does my behavior demonstrate that? And the answer is no. So the key, the key to change is you've got to change your identity. I, my identity was one of less than that. I did not believe that I was divine. I did not believe that I was a perfect creation. I did not believe that I designed happiness or uh, deserved happiness. As soon as that identity shifted to who I truly was, who God designed me to be and who God created me to be, that shift was instantaneous. Again, three months, the journey was about three months from being utterly depressed to people just going, who are you? Who are you? Who are you? And look, a big life requires big energy. A big marriage requires big energy. Big money requires big energy. How, how many people do you know that have got a crazy good marriage that just go around like this all day, just like moping around, and, you know, shoulders full? Like, if, if I'm doing this interview like this, what are you buying, man? What are you buying from me? Am I a happy person? Am I confident? <laughs> have I got a good marriage? Have I got a good business? Have I got a good relationship? It's like, no, no, no. A big life requires big energy. It does. That's where it starts, right? you, you got to understand that. And it's like, this is what this book is about. It's like, how do you get to the point to <clears throat> identify the lies, uncover your true identity, who you truly are divinely? Forget the ego. The ego is a lie. The, the ego is there to... to to build himself up and to create his own sense of self-worth. We've got to get rid of the ego. Who are you truly? Who are you divine, create, divinely created to be? And then you got to start walking in that. you got to start walking in that. And if you can't find some energy, man, give it up, right? Give it up. Because a big life requires big energy. Big marriage requires big energy. Big money requires big energy. And at the end of it, this is what people are recognizing, right? When, when, when they're saying, who are you? I don't recognize you. They're seeing a level of energy that, that was not there six months ago. Mm -hmm. the ultimate state of lack of energy. Here's the thing, right? Most people don't think about this. What is the ultimate? You've got super, super high, super big energy, and then you've got no energy at all. What is the ultimate state of no energy? When all energy leaves your body, you are dead. The ultimate state of a lack of energy is dead, right? Right. When zero energy remains in your body, you're dead. As long as there's some energy, you're alive. And we ask people, like somebody who's, uh, you guys, you guys, you guys got some good energy there, right? You're, you're smiling, you're upbeat, stuff like that. It's like, how much, if we ask the audience, right, how much life is in these people? Good amount of life, good amount of life. If we just sit here and just kind of like, <laughs> how much life is in this dude? Not a lot of life, right? Not a lot of life. Energy is life. Energy is life. Big life requires big energy, and that's what we get to in that book, how to create that big life. Who do you need to be to create that energy? How do you create that energy? How do you walk into it, own it, become that person to where the world goes, who are you? I don't know who you are. Good, because that dude was dead, and I've been born again, my brother. If you recognized me, I would not be born again. I'd be the same dude with a new suit. No. No. I had to. I had to go in my. I had numerous times in my life, my brother. I've had to go in my mirror and look and say, "You're a nice guy, but you're not getting the job done. You're fired." 
sorry, Cody, but you are the weakest link. You got to go. You've had six months to sort this out. And this is the mess you've made. You are out of here. We're getting a new CEO into your life right now, Cody. We're getting new leadership. We're getting a new direction. And the old, the, the old guy, obviously very good looking, but just not getting the job done. Just not getting the job done. And that look, that's what a lot of people have got to do listening to this, right? And brutal honestly, you've got to go into the mirror, you've got to look in that mirror and say, look, you're a nice guy and you made it, you had a good swing in the bat, but you ain't getting it done. This is the big leagues and you're a high school player. If we're gonna make it big here, we need to get a big hitter in. If we're gonna play in the big leagues, we need to get some big lead hitters in. You're a nice guy, but you just ain't getting the job done. So you are fired. You are the weakest link, you are out of here. Hello to the new Cody. Did that answer your question? <laughs> that answered the question. Now, last question for you. Does your wife's family approve of you now? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I bought her, like, when we moved to when we moved to, uh, to Australia, I bought, we went back to England, and I, and I bought us first-class tickets. Did you do that? It was very expensive, <laughs> but I didn't care because my wife's worth it. This was, you know, this was probably... Oh, about 18 months, two, two years after like the recovery process took place. And yeah, we went, I went over to her house and I said, we're going to England first class, me and my wife. And I had one son at the time. We're going to England first class. So have you ever flown first class? <laughs> I'll let you know what it's like. <laughs> <laughs> I'll take lots of pictures to show you. Yeah, it's like Toby Keith. How do you like me now? <laughs> <laughs> I'm flying first class today. <laughs> <laughs> so they're proud of you now. <laughs> well, I hope so. Yeah, it's like their in-laws, man. They're never going to be proud. That just would not that would not be that would not be in, in in line with their character. It's like it's never enough with them. It's never enough. They always want more, want more, want more. But again, it does it doesn't matter, right? Because this is this is part of it. This is what I'm talking about. It's like I I, I find my sense of self worth in the fact that I'm a divine creation from the, the, the king. I'm a child of the mm -hmm. king. His approval. We said it in the interview, right? We said it earlier on. The, the, way to, the way to change your life is to find somebody that opinion you value greater than your own that you would not want to disappoint under any circumstances. Well, that's the king for me. I'm, I'm, I'm a child of the king, and it's like, as long as I, my, my goal is to make him happy, if the world disapproves, and there'll be, there'll be people that listen to this interview. We've talked about some stuff. People are going to go, oh, don't like that. Or, Why is he talking <laughs> this yeah, so i can't believe he's saying that there's going to be people that disapprove but you know what that that's fine i'm not talking to those people there, there are people that there, there are people that need to hear this there, there are people that need to hear this right there are people that, that, that are lost right now and they don't need to be there are people that are suffering right now and they don't need to be there are people that are in pain right now and they don't need to be that's who i'm talking to yeah. and my in-laws fall into the same category it's like i'm not i'm not li living my life to get the approval from them, right? So do they approve or not? To be perfectly honest with you, I don't know. I, I, I don't. <laughs> it's none of my business. <laughs> <laughs> it's not oh, that man. I don't care, I'm just I'm just unaware. Yeah. yeah. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> Which is a good place to be, right? <laughs> Absolutely. So Cody, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today. We appreciate it for everyone who listened and watched. Thank you for letting us disrupt your mm -hmm. everyday. God bless you, brother and sister. May, may, may Jesus bring all blessings to you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for listening to the Disrupt the Everyday podcast. For more ways to listen, connect with us on social media. To be a guest or to partner with us, check out our link tree at Disrupt the Everyday. Join us next time for more ways to disrupt the everyday.